Uh, so before I um, go to the uh, panelists, let me just uh, say a few words to, uh, to, uh, for set the scene for this particular session. Right? Um, just over, just about under a year ago, right, 140 con countries gathered in Sweden, in Stockholm, um, uh, for the third UN uh, Ministerial Conference on uh, Road Safety. Uh, the conference put forward a landmark Stockholm Declaration, which called for a new global target to reduce road traffic death and injury by 50% by uh, 2030. In August 2020, uh, the UN General Assembly passed the Improving uh, Global Road Safety Resolution, endorsing the, uh, uh, the Stockholm Declaration and playing the role for what we call the new decade of action, 2021 to 2030. Um, the declaration called for the member state to reaffirm their commitment to the 2030 agenda and recognize the synergy um, among the SDG goals, um, connecting, for example, to, um, to carbon, uh, to emission, emission agenda, et cetera. Um, on top of this, it was a, a recognition and a joint um, recognition of a system approach uh, that needs, uh, uh, because this is a system, systemic problem that we're facing for decades, and it requires a system um, uh, approach. And a well-designed mobility system can generate both safe and sustainable uh, solutions. And it's also recognized that uh, of the 1.35 or 1.4 million deaths a year, 93% of them are in low and middle-income countries. So that's where the effort has to be uh, focused on. Um, I should also mention that uh, um, uh, as we talk about this new decade of, uh, of actions, uh, 2020, of course, is, uh, is the year that characterized by COVID-19. And as city emerge from the COVID-19 crisis, how do we tackle um, a road safety agenda under this new lanes is also uh, emerging and a current topic that we all cope with. For example, um, the concern about uh, the uh, public transportation, safety on public transportation, may induce people to go back to cars, which we have seen some of that uh, emerging. So how do we tackle this new challenge um, uh, as we speak? So that's uh, one of the area uh, for focus uh, for this uh, new global um, uh, um, decade for actions. Uh, I think you saw a little bit in the video on the World Bank side, we're obviously very committed to the world safety agenda. And we've been working on this uh, for, for decades and working with many of our partners and uh, we also host the Global World Safety uh, Facilities and our new uh, World Bank's uh, uh, Environment and Social Framework explicitly include world safety as one of the uh, standards. Uh, I should also mention that uh, over the last couple of years, um, uh, in order to help implement this requirement, we also developed a tool called World Safety Screening and Appraisal Tool, which apply to all World Bank finance uh, transport projects. And this is really to help us to really internalize uh, road safety in the project appraisal and making trade-off and making mitigating efforts uh, in tackling these agendas. Uh, as for the launch of this in 1919, 19, uh, 2019, we are now making this as a requirement for all open funded uh, road projects uh, moving forward. So with that, uh, I'll stop and then I will pass on to our extreme uh, uh, panelists and I will go to done with some questions, um, and then uh, we'll ask the panelists to limit their response to uh, two, three minutes so that we can uh, go around the, uh, the panels, and then we'll try to keep some time uh, for audience to, um, to interact with our panelists. And uh, my colleague is keeping track of the uh, question in the chat box, and we will aggregate them and go to our panelists a bit later. So let me start, maybe a first question I'll go to, uh, uh, go to Matthew. Now, with this uh, uh, reduction of traffic death and injury by, uh, by 50% by 2030, I think there was some noise, um, uh, I think, for people working the, in, the, in this field to say, is this realistic? Is this achievable? Because we declared that uh, 10 years ago in the first decade of, uh, of action. Have we achieved that? Uh, so how do you respond to, uh, uh, to this question, uh, Matthew? Well, hello everybody. Hi, Guan Che. Good to see so many friends on the panel and 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 the chat. Uh, so many names. Lovely to be with you. It's a great question, Guan Che, and I think it's one that all of us in the road safety community globally 
have to be able to answer convincingly. I think it was Einstein who said that the definition of madness is uh, doing the same thing again and expecting a totally different result. Um, and so the answer is we mustn't just do the same thing again. Before I pass on from the previous decade, we did manage to stabilize the number of deaths. Now that may sound like not very much, but given the, the patterns in terms of the increased levels of motorization across the world, that was not an insignificant achievement, but it is very clear that we're gonna have to do much better. We will have possibly a billion new cars coming onto the market by 2030. And if we do nothing, to turn Einstein's epithet on its head, we will not succeed. So you mentioned it yourself, Quanche. We need to apply the safe system principles, sometimes known as the Vision Zero principles, and apply them systematically. And I think Etienne in the session earlier today referred to the work that's now going on to produce, sorry, Etienne Krug from the World Health Organization, referred to the work that's now going on to develop a new global plan of action for the next decade. And frankly speaking, it's got to be a plan of action that speaks to, in an eloquent way, the Global South, um, in the European Union, we are pleased, proud to have reduced our fatalities to 23,000, about 50 per million of the population, which is still way too many, and we're still gonna try to grind them down. We have our own 50% reduction target, but it is the sharply rising numbers of deaths in the Global South that we have to be able to address successfully using the safe system, vehicle safety, infrastructure safety, uh, better post-crash care, reduced speeds, uh, possibly of reducing your death toll is to slow your speeds down by a combination of lower speed limits, better enforcement, more appropriate infrastructure. Um, and we have to go for it. And the, the, relevant, uh, the relevant comparison for me, Guanche, and I don't want to be too controversial here, is indeed the era of COVID. Because I think until recently, the deaths over the last year were very similar in terms of the orders of magnitude from COVID uh, and on the roads. Um, and uh, I think we need to be much clearer recognizing that road safety is a health issue. I'm glad it was discussed as such this afternoon. And it's a health issue which, unlike COVID, is addressing the youngest and future productive parts of our community. It's the, it's the biggest single killer of 15 to 29 year olds, which is tragic when you think about it. Um, and on COVID, we have accepted, we have demanded huge societal action to address this, even at major uh, uh, economic cost. And at the same time, we've also seen very big changes, as you said, to the pattern of mobility, uh, much more awareness of space and safety in our cities. Uh, we've seen less traffic. We've seen less traffic deaths. Uh, we're just looking at the latest figures in the European Union, about 17% down um, in the, compared to the previous year, 2019 but not proportionate to the drop in traffic. So we could do, and we could have done even better. We've seen more active mobility. We've seen less use of public transport. And I fear, as you said, in lockdown version two here in Brussels, we've seen the traffic already pouring back. So uh, the risk of metaphorical, but literal collision with the new active mobility road users is I'm afraid very real. So it's been a strange year. Um, we uh, did all those things. We got a, a new agenda set up and running. We then had to massively hit the pause button. We must come back and hit the ground running on road safety and, and try to address these things through a strong global plan of action, launch it in the UN Road Safety Week in May. There are lots of great ideas for how we campaign around these themes and we've got to deliver. It's as simple as that. Thank you, Matthew, for that intervention. Let me go to, uh, to Kelly. Um, um, Bloomberg uh, Philanthropist has been working on this agenda for more than a decade and obviously uh, focus on developing countries. Um, what's your lessons learned? How do you, as you look at this uh, next 10 years, um, what are the lessons learned that you think that we can adopt and adjust our approach to really make a, a visible impact uh, on the road safety agenda uh, based on your experience? Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you, Guanche, and thank you everyone for allowing me to participate. We're happy at Bloomberg Philanthropies to support WRI and the World Bank in our initiative and so appreciate the opportunity to be on this panel and also great to see so many people from all over the world who are saying in the chat where they're from. It's fun to see the representation in this panel. But Guanche, as you mentioned, Bloomberg Philanthropies has supported road safety since 2007. 
Um, we've committed $500 million to reduce road traffic fatalities and injuries in low and middle income countries. And I think that one of the benefits that um, comes with the, the long duration of funding a specific program is to really being able to capitalize on those lessons learned. When I think back to the work that we were doing in Mexico, Vietnam, and Cambodia in 2007, we've come such a long way now in 2020 in our strategy based on the lessons that, that we have learned through this work. Um, I will just say that we just started last year a new six-year $240 million initiative where we will be applying these lessons in 15 countries and 30 cities in low and middle income countries, working at the national level to strengthen legislation and at the city level to implement these evidence-based interventions that we know will save lives. I would say that the biggest lesson learned for us um, is really to build the political will in the locations where we're working. Um, we, when we enter into an agreement with a country or a city, we have the highest level commitment that they're willing to support road safety, to fund road safety, to build the capacity of their uh, employees, government employees, to increase their knowledge on how to implement um, evidence-based road safety interventions. And so really identifying those jurisdictions and uh, that want to work on road safety and, and really ensuring that we have the highest level of commitment. We also recognize that in, in the work that we've done, the majority of lives saved have, have come through strengthened road safety legislation. So while we're working in 15 countries and 30 cities, we really wanna marry the national level push of governments to strengthen their road safety laws with the implementation of work at the subnational level. So utilizing those outcomes at the subnational level with cities and mayors and transport agencies to push national level legislative change. I would also say another lesson learned that is so important now in the pandemic is ha having and building in country capacity. So when we first started in 2007, we, we, we used international partners and we did have maybe one or two staff within the countries. But now when we're, we're um, supporting a specific country or city, we really look to embed local staff within city level agencies, transportation, police that can serve as really that linchpin with our international partners that are providing technical support and ensuring that we have that consistent communication. And then just very quickly, two last things. I'm really doubling down on evaluation as well as improving road traffic mortality and injury data. How are we gonna know if we we're reducing fatalities if we can't measure the work that we're implementing? So at Bloomberg Philanthropies, we're investing significantly in, in observations of the work, the risk factors, speed, drinking and driving, helmet and seat belt use so that that can drive our strategy and we can demonstrate to cities the work that they're doing and how that is driving behavior, but also working with different agencies to improve the, um, the mortality data. And in some of the cities, it's been amazing. Like in Fortaleza, they're now at 53% reduction in fatalities over five years. Through, and it's great to know that and really broadcast that to, to shine a light on the work of the city. And also hope, hopefully that that will spread not only within countries, but also throughout regions. And then finally, the communications aspect. If we have all of this work, if we have the data, if we have the information, ensuring that we're communicating very broadly through uh, you know, communications officers through the cities, through national level work to really drive awareness and an understanding on the importance of road safety. So I'll stop there, but many more lessons learned, but those are the key ones. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly, and also, uh, for, for those uh, perspectives. Uh, let me quickly move to uh, uh, Ileana. Um, we know that EIB doing a lot of work with uh, private sector um, corporations and entities. Right? Uh, and you work really closely with them. Now, the question is under the new decade of action, under this uh, UN call new decade of action, what do you see as the new actors, if they are, or, and to join in this uh, road safety effort, particularly non-state actors? We obviously focus a lot 
on government commitments and agency responsibilities. What, are the, what do you see at the role of the non-state actors uh, in this agenda? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chen. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to all. Maybe, first of all, I, I want to start by, by thanking really the, the World Bank Group uh, for really inviting me as uh, EAB representative to this indeed very important session and topic because it is important because millions of people suffer and succumb to, to, to road injuries and then deaths uh, every year. Uh, and, and really, as mentioned also by, by Matthew, the uh, last year was mar marked by new global determination really to reinforce our, uh, our efforts for, for safer roads. Uh, you, you also mentioned uh, um, the, 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 our gathering and really the, the ministerial conference, uh, which was really, I believe, important important uh, event where we not only reviewed the, the progress but adopted the Stockholm Declaration which later of course was uh, uh, was endorsed by the, the, the UN uh, General Assembly. Uh, as safety is primary concern as uh, in all means, I mean the means of transport but definitely roads, roads are the most critical point. The, we, we need to discuss claiming 97 percent of, of all trans transport fatalities worldwide uh, so, um, and I, what I should say that first, maybe that the bank, we are, we have very special dedicated transport lending policy adopted in 2011. Now we are in process of uh, reviewing this policy, policy and we will have and take this opportunity to strengthen the importance of the safety and sustainability in all our future operations as we are expanding our funding and operations in transport sector with special focus on, on safety and road safety uh, specifically. So really our lending, blending, and also our advisory and technical support, which we believe is much needed to our promoters, to our beneficiaries and governments as well and local authorities um, in order to identify really those specific measures. But here in reply to your question, maybe I would like first to emphasize on the strong cooperation we have established and I believe it was reinforced last year between all the multilateral development banks um, because um, really this um, we have a long-lasting uh, cooperation uh, uh, definitely but uh, I think this cooperation enabled us to, to, to share our lessons learned and to align uh, our policies and procedures specifically to road safety but now EAB is chairing the, the working group of, uh, on road safety uh, between uh, all uh, MDBs uh, in the period of 2020, 2021. Uh, and I believe, uh, and I'm really glad that we, uh, we came up with a joint statement in support of the new UN decade of action. Um, and also, I mean, among many other things and important messages in this joint statement, we also announced that each multilateral development uh, bank should appoint a high level road safety champion really to oversee and to be dedicated on really to, to streamline the, the road safety throughout and between all organizations. And I'm proud to be the, the European Investment Bank's road safety champion. And I'm really uh, sincerely dedicated to, to, this, uh, to this challenge. One of our joint initiatives this year will be to develop common approach to road safety impact assessment. Uh, because uh, in this way, we can ensure that uh, uh, really uh, all uh, road safety aspects are properly addressed and uh, uh, in our way we finance them. Uh, of course, we will furthermore develop a, a common key performance indicators for road safety and also I believe it is important uh, to measure uh, through those common indicators really the progress and to enable better report reporting and accountability uh, because uh, this this could uh, could also include uh, um, the, 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 the expected annual uh, re uh, reduction of uh, road fatalities uh, for any new road project uh, we finance. Uh, so um, so this, is, this is maybe the, the 
I believe the the most important on how how our cooperation is uh, uh, with with MDBs. But I, I, I very important to mention here the European Union, the European Commission efforts in uh, in really achieving the the UN goals and really our common goal to to reduce uh, by 50 percent uh, in the, in the decade uh, by 2030 road deaths. Uh, okay. As, as uh, Matthew mentioned, the, the, the adopted uh, Vision Zero uh, is, is really a very ambitious document, but I don't think, it, I think it's a, it's a realistic one. Uh, and uh, I, I believe it's a very good document. And, um, and as, uh, as, as we already see the EU, we were able I mean, to see in EU uh, already 50% re reduction of the, of the road deaths. So I, uh, I believe now we need to, to focus more efforts on how to support all other regions around the world by really streamlining this, uh, the, this, uh, this, uh, this policy. As I said, it is really part of our uh, most important criteria when we select and finance and support projects. Maybe I could give three good examples like uh, uh, a Ukrainian project on uh, urban road safety uh, was uh, was approved recently for five of the five biggest cities in Ukraine, 177 million euro for road safety in uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, also in Greece, 470 million euro um, investment for road rehabilitation and safety, especially the especially safety is earmarked as, as a top priority as well. Also, we are planning to 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 launch. Uh, a road safety communication campaign in uh, uh, in Armenia in March this year with uh, with the EU delegation with the local government authority again aiming to reduce uh, road death by by really changing uh, behavior uh, behavior of, of people like decreased speeding increased seat belt use uh, decreased drunk driving decreased distracted driving uh, important elements so Partnerships are important. Only, only if we are together in this exercise, we, we can we can be successful. Maybe I should stop here, uh, and Thanks. we can. We'll come back. Thanks so much, uh, Nina. Thank you. Okay. Let me uh, move on to the topic we briefly touch upon, which is that this is a systemic issue that require a safe system approach. And I want to go to Kevin from your research work, and also how that linked to. I think quite a bit of the chat room were talking about impacts evaluation. I think Kelly mentioned it, Liliana mentioned it, and I think you have done some work in that area. I guess the question uh, for you is that all this analytical work and measuring work, how do they actually end up influencing public policy and actions on the ground? Yeah, thank you, Wang Um So I can speak to that from, from two perspectives. So uh, now I'm, I'm in academia and I'm uh, a researcher focused on the uh, broad class of health interventions, but uh, including road safety interventions. But in my previous uh, job, I was at the Development Impact Evaluation Group at the World Bank, and we had a, a large program of transport evaluations, um, and it was with support from 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 DFID and and some support from the GRSF uh, for for some of our work in Malawi and and Tanzania. And so I have some sort of thoughts on on how that. Uh, that research and evaluation and measurement spoke to the kinds of policy concerns that that you're mentioning. I think there's kind of three broad areas in which I see the measurement and evaluation and learning agenda speaking to these broader questions. Uh, in in our time at um, in my time at Dime and my work with my colleagues there, and also my work now um, at HSPH, you know, there's a general idea and framework around, you know, really only investing in programs that can be demonstrated in, um, in a causal framework to have shown impact on, um, on lives saved and on reduced mortality and morbidity. And that's something where I think many road safety interventions have uh, enormous, enormous promise, which has already been documented in many ways, but which really uh, could be documented better and, and could be brought into um, the research community in, in ways that, you know, it, it still hasn't been in, at least in the health world. And 
I think uh, I remember speaking to you know highway engineers and road safety experts as we were developing the iConnect proposal, and they would talk about the dramatic efficacy that they would see for infrastructure improvements on highways and you know remediation of black spots, and we would tell them that this was really promising from a, an evaluation perspective, and this sounded extremely cost effective, and we'd love to study it. But we would often come up against uh, basic administrative data problems. Um, and so that gets to sort of the next set of, of thoughts. And uh, in the process of one of these uh, iConnect, which is the Dime uh, World Bank Initiative, uh, we've been working on one of the elements of the safe system that you mentioned, post-crash post care. Um, and in, in both Malawi and Tanzania, uh, one of the, there was a, a subcomponent of a large multi-country bank operation, a transport operation, which was set aside for investing in post-crash care. Uh, it was a relatively small part of the overall road uh, investment, um, but we, we thought it was really critical to focus on measurement and, and evaluation of these elements, in part because they were so new for transport projects, or at least World Bank transport projects. And so we worked with a group of um, clinicians and, um, and surgeons and, and health system experts in Malawi, uh, as well as in Tanzania, to uh, set up what are called trauma registries. So, um, you know, essentially data capture um, tools in a, a large set of uh, central and district hospitals to capture all the uh, forms of trauma coming in on an ongoing basis, uh, much of which is road traffic related, but, but not all. Um, and I think this has really helped us understand the burden of trauma more generally and only highlighted the, the role of uh, road traffic safety but in a very different way across settings. Uh, and this gets to the, the point about targeting. Uh, the data in Tanzania shows, uh, at least in the transport corridors we're working, that the trauma burden is largely motorcycle related. So 40% of all trauma and 70% of uh, road traffic trauma in the hospitals where we're working is about motorcycles. Uh, by contrast, in Malawi, it's much more an issue of pedestrians and cyclists getting struck by moving vehicles. And um, the, you know, the burden of trauma is about evenly split between people actually operating vehicles and people operating bicycles and, and, and pedestrians. And it's, it's actually no different between the central hospitals and the district hospitals in Malawi, despite you know, the thoughts some might have that you know, road traffic accidents are less common you know, outside of, of, of urban settings. And so that kind of targeting is really more possible with this aggregated data. Um, I would, I would, you know, re sort of reiterate or, or strongly agree with what, what Kelly said about the importance for evaluation, both for learning what works, but also for knowing if we hit our targets. Um, I think this kind of uh, cooperation with the health sector and, and so that, you know, uh, melding together traffic and, and accident data with clinical and hospital based data is one of the promising ways we can understand the overall burden. Um, so, so I'll leave it there, but it's, it's very nice to see it all here. Thanks, uh, Kevin. Okay, um, just before I go to Iman, just to say that there's a lot of uh, very lively uh, questions and comments from the chat box. And at the same time, obviously among the audience, there are response to, to some of those questions. Uh, so I just want uh, for folks to, to monitor that. But uh, Iman, I want to come to you since you are um, working in the Africa region as the for WBI. As uh, I think the uh, previous speaker mentioned, right? if we're gonna make a difference in the next decade, it has to focus on low-income and middle-income countries. And Africa, obviously, is one of those uh, areas that we have to focus on. So from your experience, have you seen much progress they make in the continent, uh, Africa continent? And how do you feel on those uh, progress? And, and what is the sort of uh, key agenda from, uh, from your experience uh, uh, for the Africa region, picking up the good experience and then good lessons learned that you have picked up in uh, some of the low-income countries? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, I think the, the question that you asked is exactly what I was going to start with, because when I first started working at, at WRI, it was right when the Bloomberg Initiative for Global Road Safety had just launched in Addis. And seeing the change and the transformation, as Kelly, you mentioned, has been unbelievable. We started with, you know, talking about the road safety agenda and trying to build technical capacity at a low level. And road safety is now a national agenda because of all the great work that has been done 
in, in Addis. And we're seeing that this is not just the case in Ethiopia, but in many other African cities. And the reason being that African cities are already struggling in terms of economic growth, resources, poverty, climate change. And as a continent, we are really facing some of the most challenging economic, environmental, and social issues. We can't afford to lose 5% or more of our economic productivity to a problem that has a solution and that is avoidable. And as the youngest continent, um, there's huge potential for transformation with our youth, and we definitely cannot afford to lose our most active and productive population group, our 15 to 29-year-olds, to road traffic collisions. And COVID-19 has really shown us that our cities are not accessible and they're not safe. We weren't able to, to, to lock down or, or work remotely or have deliveries. We, um, it wasn't your basic access to resources or even urban amenities were not even within walking or cycling dis distances. So it, the way our cities are designed, the way they're planned, that really needs to change. And I think that has really emphasized the need to talk about accessibility, to talk about safety, to talk about livability. So in terms of really building on the momentum there is now, I think the first thing has to be in, in really leveraging the urban infrastructure and the two thirds of the urban infrastructure in Africa is yet to be built. And I think uh, the conversations that I'm seeing in the chat is that there should really be um, road safety should really be part and parcel of these uh, urban infrastructure projects and really at the center. And we, we talk about road safety audits and we talk about making that mandatory with, you know, your LRT systems, your BRT systems about reforming paratransit. But we really need to ensure that it trickles down. So I think the most important thing is really implementation and really ensuring that things are happening on the ground and they're happening in the most effective and coordinated way. So one way to do that is, you know, the Bloomberg initiative model, we talk about this multiple times is we come as a package. So to cities, it's easier because when they want to talk about speed management, there's the enforcement, there's the awareness component, there's the safer streets, there's the policy. So it makes it easier for them to, to sort of work with this organized sort of group that, that understands road, road safety from a holistic perspective, but comes with the technical knowledge for them to tap into. So this sort of model, I think, needs to be um, um, replicated. And even within NGOs, within banks, um, and within private sector, so it makes it easier for government to really build on the momentum. The second thing I, I think is, is very important is really um, a lot of the road safety work that we're seeing in African cities sits with individuals. So when those individuals leave or there's changes in leadership, and we know the political environment in, in African regions is really dynamic, uh, I think that's the best way to put it, is that w when one leader or uh, uh, so an individual leaves the road safety agenda or what we're working on could take five, 10 steps back. So we need to institutionalize this within you know, policies and strategies and plans, but we also need to make sure that we're partnering with the right um, implementing partners. So whether that's universities, local NGOs, um, grassroots level organizations, uh, and really ensure that even um, that they can carry on this work and ensure that the way that it's being designed and planned is inclusive and looks at sort of the, the, the road user needs. And so in that way, it, it, it's much more sustainable. And I think lastly, really, um, uh, when we are talking about um, non, especially non-motorized transport, I think that's has, has and cycling has become a very common and, and um, hot topic for many African cities. And so really to build on that momentum and car free days and open streets movement have been an inspiring way for people to understand and, and, and um, how, what their cities can look like with, with more shared um, streets and safer streets. So using these sort of initiatives, I think could really build on the momentum and get us to, to our goal. Thank you, Iman. Um, we, uh, we have about another 20 minutes left. I do want uh, our panelists to come and, and uh, get a perspective on one a very current issue, uh, which is the interlinkage between road safety and other global sort of uh, global issues. Right? Um, we'll talk about sustainable mobilities, about climate, uh, climate change uh, impacts. And of course, now under the COVID, you know, how do we manage this uh, sustainable, sustainably? 
uh, of the public transportation uh, with this challenge. So I will open it to our, um, to our panelists, but maybe I'll go to Matthew first, since the uh, um, European um, Commission come up with this uh, um, uh, green, green deal, right? talk about sustainable uh, mobility. So how do you see that link to the road safety agenda? Well, the simple, then, uh, the, the simple answer I have is that there's no sustainability without safety, but that's very simple and glib. And I think uh, there's, a, there's a more complex way into this, which is to look at this from the perspective of external costs. And we've done a lot of work on that in the European Union. It's very interesting in the urban context, particularly because you get some great win-win uh, situations, co-benefits, if you like, from addressing uh, one issue and you, you'll, you'll roll out things on, on lots of different areas. Example, if we take action to reduce uh, deaths and serious injuries for active mobility uh, uh, folks, um, and thereby, um, you know, we, we take some serious action to reduce our dependence on, on particularly privately owned uh, conventionally fueled cars. We get better air quality, we reduce our CO2 emissions, we reduce congestion, um, um, we get, of course, the better, uh, less noise, we ha and we have better road safety. It's, it's a win-win across the board. It's uh, making our cities more livable. Um, and and, and I, I really stress the need for road safety to get out of its corner to be a little less apologetic and conventional in its arguments and make these uh, linkages to what I call the sustainable agenda, the urban agenda, um, and, and talk about Vision Zero being the new road vaccine, proven yet radical, and we need to apply it uh, globally. So less apologetic, more links to health, more links to development, and more links to the global justice movement. Well said, Matthew. Um, I don't know, Kelly or Lilian, you want to come on? on I, yeah, I'll, I'll start and I would just say that for the work that we support, our primary indicator is lives saved. Um, and we can do that through improving the safety on the roads as well as increasing sustainability. Um, for us, um, we recognize that all of the work we do through WRI, the World Bank, GRSF, as well as uh, Global Designing Cities Initiative and really redesigning city streets so it makes it's making it safe for everyone, all road users, and really working to get people out of cars and into um, public transportation on bicycles and walking more. And also there have been a lot of opportunities in this pandemic to increase that work, but that is one of the areas that we're totally committed to. And while we're looking specifically at Live Save, when we meet with Mike Bloomberg, he wants to know how many lives saved have we, how many lives have we saved through our road safety work? And we have saved more than 312,000 lives. And that's without looking really closely at the sustainability issue. And, and so I think that that's something that we can improve upon in this next five years uh, of our initiative and we'll prioritize that. Let me pick up a few questions for, from the audience and I go to our, our panelists. Uh, one question actually just coming from uh, Jacob Mason. Um, he said it generally support the um, idea of this uh, data-driven approach to improve road safety, but worry about this approach only address the symptom, uh, but not the root cause of the problem. And the root cause of the problem is, in a way, is, is auto-centric development, a sort of, you could call it culture. Or <laughs> uh, maybe Kevin, since uh, you've done a lot of research in this area, how do we change this uh, root cause uh, um, of uh, road safety challenge we're facing? So I thought that was a really good comment. I'm, I think one way I think about this, I think about the work again of, of some of our colleagues. So, so for example, um, some of my colleagues have been studying some um, important innovations in Dar Salaam, the, uh, the creation of the, the bus rapid transit system. And one of the things that we thought uh, as, we were, as we were thinking through BRT evaluation designs in Dar Salaam, Dakar, elsewhere, is about these kind of multiple benefits and, and whether there are ways to generate research strategies which could estimate not only the, the health benefits from reduced admissions, potentially the, uh, the road safety benefits from, from possibly reduced traffic, uh, as well as the broader economic benefits from linking potentially you know, lower income uh, communities to jobs in the central business district. And that's a, um, that's a 
research agenda which uh, involves investing heavily in, in data, but in a comprehensive and, and system-wide way, which uh, with some you know, structural modeling to, you know, to the, the uh, broader system helps us gain some insights into what it means to move from a more car-centric model. Um, so that's work that, that's ongoing, and I think it's really hugely promising. Um, so I think there, are, uh, there aren't easy answers to, to kind of understanding these broader benefits, uh, but I think it's, it's hugely beneficial to, to put the effort in, and that's the kind of work I think we should, you know, we should do more of. Thank, thank you, Kevin. I want to also share one observation, I think, from Mark um, Corbin, talking about sort of the second decade of, uh, of actions and in, in targets. So this topic has been going on for so long. Um, it's increasingly hard to convince the decision maker uh, despite of ample evidence about what needs to be done in road safety. I wonder whether we need to lift this challenge out of it, take it out of transportation. It's not a transportation challenge, but it's a health and education challenge. And wonder from um, our, our panelists, whether from your perspective, your experience, uh, whether you could comment uh, or, or make some observation on this uh, uh, in this observation. Uh, come on these observations. Go ahead, um, Matthew. Just wants to jump in. I don't want to hog the microphone here. <laughs> it's it's the right question about getting road safety out of its corner, and uh, I think going back to all the discussions and points made by Kelly and others, governance. Uh, we need to take a really hard look at, at governance. Um, uh, 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 issues in road safety and make sure that just from across different governments we have all different departments involved. I'll come to health and education in a moment but all too often you have interior ministries, you have uh, transport ministries separate uh, from justice ministries and so you have a very piecemeal approach to all the different elements we need to apply the safe system and the vision zero principles. Um, health ministries have been historically very reluctant to get involved. I'm sure Kevin would confirm that. Um, just to, to, so we're not agreeing with each other the whole time, I would be a little wary about putting too much emphasis on education, because if you look at the evidence, it's not a strong cost, uh, cost effective basis. Uh, and if you think about it from a vision zero um, safe system point of view, it's not about teaching children to make themselves safer. We need to build a system which makes them safer. Um, uh, the, the whole idea that teaching children not to step off the curb in towns because otherwise you might get killed. No, we need to find other ways to keep them safe than that. So I agree with half of the point, but I absolutely agree we need to get road safety out of its corner and join it up in, in different areas of, of government. Okay, thank you. Um, just, Liliana. just one thing. Okay, okay. Uh, Kelly and then Liliana. Thanks, thanks for that, Matthew. Totally agree. And I would say the first question you asked me was lessons learned. And when we first started our uh, Bloomberg work, we directed our work through the Ministry of Health. And we learned very quickly that, that they are not going to be the leaders on road safety and that we needed to make sure that, yes, they were included as one of the many ministries or agencies that were working on road safety, but really focusing our our direction through transportation but ensuring that there is that cross agency or cross ministry collaboration thank you kelly there's a one question to you about, about how you work with uh, ngos not just governments maybe you can come back a bit later but liliana you, i think you want to jump in and along with that i think there was a question uh, uh, about what you mentioned about uh, earlier, the champions of uh, MDP. Uh, there, I think there was a question about, can you be a, a little bit more information about who's the champion, who are the champions? Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, I, I will, I tried to reply to that uh, question already by saying that each MDB should nominate and announce it, but soon we will have a gathering, a specially dedicated meeting of all champions uh, of, with, uh, with, with, within each uh, an institution and we will announce it of course and we will announce uh, all the champions once they're uh, nominated. They, the good news is that almost all were nominated, they are at a high level and uh, this, is, this is a very good sign that we have an engagement at a very high level and it is, it is indeed a very, very important. Uh, also, if I, if I may, because we, we, we were talking about uh, how to involve others, I, I fully agree with, with what was shared. Definitely we need to involvement of, of all in different dimensions, but 
Um, but in terms of really the, the new approaches and based on the, the legislation is there, I should say. Uh, I think that the new, the new, the, for example, the new EU directive on road safety, it's a unique legislation. It really prescribes strict rules. But uh, it's important how we enforce this legislation, really the, the implementation and involvement of all different stakeholders. Here in the EAB, now whenever we uh, finance uh, and we, uh, we apply uh, our principles on how we finance projects, we apply those uh, how say principles um, uh, related to really inclusion of safety, planning, design, implementation, operation, of, of road also for our non-EU financing uh, because really uh, this we believe this is important. So road safety impact assessment will uh, now uh, really become our uh, requirement, uh, uh, really a standard requirement for all projects uh, we finance all around the world because this will give us not only clear picture but which will help us and governments as well to identify any problems which need to be to be addressed and also we we are planning uh, to, to introduce this kind of safety ratings uh, to benchmark and to to enhance the, the built-in safety standards in in, uh, in in the in the infrastructure we are financing uh, together with uh, other um, with other IFIs and with, with the commi commi commission etc uh, and uh, this is this is also, I believe, uh, important important initiative uh, to to have all stakeholders. And uh, something uh, also as uh, as uh, really to complement Matthew on, on Vision Zero, as uh, he called it, uh, really the, the new road vaccine, which is a very very good uh, uh, approach. But I, I would like to to, to really to, to all of us uh, to see engagement of all institutions in really on the implementation of so-called safe system approach, which was uh, introduced. We have already some good examples in Cyprus, for example. And what I, what I really like about this, this approach is that we have in, uh, in involvement of all uh, groups uh, in, in, in this, not only drivers, but mot motorcyclists, uh, passengers, pedestrians, uh, drivers of heavy vehicles, because we need uh, also this not only data but but uh, kind of a, a holistic approach and holistic view of, of the, the system and uh, and they all, uh, this interaction between uh, uh, between vehicles users uh, and and uh, and roads and all authorities which are which are um, uh, in charge and last but not least effective solutions are there like uh, uh, like really um, measures related to, to speeding and protection of, uh, of uh, vulnerable users, safe crossing for pedestrians, sidewalks, uh, bike, uh, bicycle lanes. And so the, the measures and uh, the, the solutions are there. It's, it's really now important to, to implement, to enforce them uh, efficiently and, uh, and in order to, to, to have this kind of a kickoff success. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, welcome back, uh, Iman. I know you, we lost you a little bit, maybe because the internet connections, that's the challenge in, in, the, in, in the current uh, settings. Uh, I have one question coming in. I thought it's interesting. Uh, and maybe Iman or Kevin, you can, you can comment on it, um, which is kind of looking at the political economy dimension of uh, road safety. So the question was, how do we convince uh, uh, politicians that road safety it's actually good for them to get votes because that's that's how how you influence uh, uh, policy makings and they, they they see that it's not just building expressway uh, that will help them but also building safer uh, access will is equally important i think Iman, you might want to comment from from your experience in working in africa but maybe kevin as well please go ahead Iman. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Sorry, the connection's breaking up, so could you yeah. please repeat the question? Oh, it's, sorry. <laughs> Maybe I'll ask. Uh, um, okay, go ahead. Um, Kevin, go ahead, and uh, I'll, I'll send that to, to Iman. Yeah. So, so one thing I would say about that that we've learned from the politics of broader public health initiatives is that 
they don't start from politicians thinking about votes. They usually start from technocrats in a ministry. That's often the case. That's even the case for primary health care programs, which benefit the entire population, even in settings with high mortality. They usually start from a group of committed technocrats. However, those technocrats crucially need to have a, a, a sort of political antenna to, to know how to work with politicians and to institutionalize. Um, since Iman mentioned that, you know, the, the fact that um, politicians uh, change over time and, and they're more likely to persist in a uh, given policy um, area if there are uh, institutionalized uh, groups that are working on this over time. I think politicians can be, um, can be brought on board to seeing it as something that, that wins them support because road traffic crashes are very salient. They're in the news. Um, and especially in very, very dangerous uh, high traffic uh, transport corridors, for example, as we were discussing in Southern Africa. Um, in, in Tanzania, the, the corridor that we're working on is also the transport corridor between Dar es Salaam and the, and the capital in Dodoma. And politicians are very aware of the, of the um, scale and the importance of road traffic. So I think that link is there to be made. But what the lessons of other uh, health programs show is that it usually starts with technocrats in the ministry or ministries who can then raise it onto the political agenda, working with civil society to push it, to push it up. Okay, we are, we're top, almost running out of time, but, but Iman, if you can hear me, the, the question was basically the political economy dimension. So yeah. how do we get politicians <laughs> to really embrace this agenda that is good for them uh, politically? So that was the question and we'll ask your experience in the working in, in uh, African countries. Thank you. Thank you so much for repeating that, Chen. So I think our, our uh, experience has been that actually road safety has been our entry point into uh, talking about the larger sustainable mobility sort of topic, because for politicians, it's actually uh, a low hanging fruit and sort of easier, more digestible. And you can work on, um, you know, a road safety strategy versus like a transport policy, which could be much more complicated. So we're, what we've seen with our expertise is we actually go in safety agenda. And like Kevin, you said, it's it's something that's on the news. Um, people, you know, really pay attention to this. And there's a lot of stories and campaigns and awareness that that is attached to this that that a lot of politicians, uh, you know, attach their legacies to. So in the, in the African context, we've actually seen uptake with this. The, the, the issue actually has been in making sure there's on the ground change and impact that 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 changes lives. So um, uh, we're hoping to push that and, and really. I think we lost again. Oh, well, um, colleagues and friends, unfortunately, we are running out of time. I think we have one minute left for these sessions. Um, so I want to close it, but I think I recognize that I think the video that I realized that we played earlier lost sounds. So I think our colleague has fixed it now. So when we finish this, I think we'll play the video for those of you who can stay on. Uh, you can stay on uh, to watch that little video. But uh, really, I don't have time to summarize for this uh, really rich conversation, but I want to take this opportunity first to thank the audience for your active participation and all the questions that you, uh, you raised. My colleagues will keep track of those and then we'll uh, respond to uh, as much as we could and say some of them have been response among the audience themselves. But of course, I want to take this opportunity to thank our panelists uh, for sharing their insights and uh, their perspective uh, for this uh, challenge and this agenda that we all share and we all, all work very really hard uh, to tackle. And let's wish, uh, work together and um, hope that the, the Next, this decade of action will produce a tangible uh, outcomes uh, uh, for all of us uh, in humankind. Thank you.